Book three of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume two, Part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume two, by François René de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Texera de Matos. Book three like the migratory birds i am seized in the month of october with a restlessness which would oblige me to change my clime were i still strong on the wing and swift as the hours the clouds flitting across the sky make me long to flee in order to cheat this instinct i made for chantilly i have wandered on the lawn where old keepers crawl along the border of the woods some crows flying in front of me over broom coppice and glades have led me to the Comel ponds Death has breathed upon the friends who used to accompany me to the castle of Queen Blanche. The sights of these solitudes were but a sad horizon, half opened for a moment on the side of my past. In the days of René, I should have found mysteries of life in the little stream of the Teve. It steals hidden among horse-tails and mosses. Reeds screen it from sight. It dies in the ponds which it feeds with its youth, ever expiring, ever renewed. Those ripples used to charm me when I bore within myself the desert with the phantoms which smiled to me for all their melancholy, and which I decked with flowers. Walking back along the hedges, now scarcely traced, I was surprised by the rain. I took shelter beneath a beech. Its last leaves were falling like my ears. Its top was stripping itself like my head. Its trunk was marked with a red circle, to be cut down like myself. Now that I have returned to my inn, with a harvest of autumn plants, and in a mood little suited for joy, I will tell you of the death of Monsieur le Duc d'Anguien, while within sight of the ruins of Chantilly. This death at first froze all hearts with terror. Men dreaded a return of the reign of Robespierre. Paris thought it was seeing again one of those days which men do not see more than once, the day of the execution of Louis Sixteenth. Bonaparte's servants, friends and family were struck with consternation. Abroad, though the language of diplomacy promptly stifled the popular feeling, the latter none the less stirred the hearts of the crowd in the exiled family of the bourbons the blow struck through and through louis the eighteenth returned to the king of spain the order of the golden fleece with which bonaparte had just been decorated it was accompanied by a letter which did honour to the royal mind sir and dear cousin there can be nothing in common between me and the great criminal whom audacity and fortune have placed on a throne which he has had the barbarity to stain with the blood of a bourbon the duc d'enghien religion may prompt me to forgive an assassin but the tyrant of my people must always be my enemy. Providence, for inexplicable reasons, can condemn me to end my days in exile, but never shall my contemporaries, nor posterity, be able to say that I showed myself in time of adversity unworthy to occupy, till my last breath, the throne of my ancestors. We must not forget another name connected with that of the Duc d'Anguien, Gustavus Adolphus, since dethroned and exiled, was the only one of the kings then reigning, who dared to raise a voice to save the young French prince. He dispatched an aide-de-camp from Karlsruhe, bearing a letter for Bonaparte. The letter arrived too late. The last of the Condes was no more. Gustavus Adolphus returned the ribbon of the Black Eagle to the King of Prussia, as Louis XVIII had returned the Golden Fleece to the King of Spain. Gustavus declared to the heir of Frederick the Great that, according to the laws of chivalry, he could not consent to be the brother-in-arms of the butcher of the Duc d'Enghien there is an inexpressibly bitter irony in these almost mad memories of chivalry everywhere extinct save in the heart of an unhappy king for a murdered friend honour to the noble sympathies of misfortune which stand aloof not understood in a world unknown to men alas we had undergone too many different tyrannies our characters broken by a succession of hardships and oppressions lack sufficient energy to allow our grief long to wear mourning for the death of young conde gradually the tears dried up fear overflowed with congratulations on the dangers from which the first consul had just escaped it wept with gratitude at having been saved by a so sacred immolation nero at seneca's dictation wrote to the senate a letter of apology for the murder of agrippina the senators delighted heaped blessings upon the magnanimous son who had not feared to pluck out his heart by so salutary an act of parricide society soon returned to its pleasures it was afraid of its mourning after the terror the victims who had been spared danced forced themselves to appear happy and fearing lest they should be suspected guilty of the crime of memory displayed the same gaiety as when they went to the scaffold the duc d'enghien was not arrested point-blank and without precautions bonaparte had had a report drawn up of the number of bourbons in europe 
in a council to which Monsieur de talleyrand and fouché were summoned it was recognised that the duc d'angoulême was at warsaw with louis XVIII, the comte d'artois and the duc de berry in london with the princes de conde and de bourbon the youngest of the condes was at ettenheim in the duchy of baden it was found that two english agents messrs taylor and drake had conducted intrigues in that quarter on the sixteenth of june eighteen o three the duc de bourbon warned his grandson against a possible arrest by means of a note addressed to him from london which is still preserved bonaparte summoned the two consuls his colleagues to his side he first bitterly reproached m Réal for having left him in ignorance of what was being planned against him he patiently listened to the objections the one to express himself with the greatest vigour was cambacérès bonaparte thanked him and took no further notice this is what i have seen in the memoirs of cambacérès which one of his nephews m de cambacérès a peer of france has permitted me to consult with an obligingness of which i retain a grateful recollection the bomb once thrown does not return it goes where the engineer flings it and falls to execute bonaparte's orders it was necessary to violate the territory of germany and the territory was violated forthwith the duc d'enghien was arrested at ettenheim with him were found instead of general du Mourier, only the marquis de tumeuil and some other emigrants of little note this ought to have shown the mistake the duc d'enghien was taken to strasbourg the beginning of the catastrophe of vincennes has been narrated by the prince himself he has left a little road journal from ettenheim to strasbourg the hero of the tragedy steps before the curtain to recite this prologue thursday fifteenth march at ettenheim my house surrounded says the prince by a detachment of dragoons and some pickets of gendarmes total about two hundred men two generals the colonel of the dragoons colonel chariot of the strasbourg gendarmerie at five o'clock at half-past five doors broken in taken to the mill near the tower-works my papers taken away sealed up taken in a cart between two lines of fusiliers to the rhine put on board a boat for risnau landed and marched on foot as far as fortsheim breakfasted at the inn got into a carriage with colonel chariot the quartermaster of the gendarme a gendarme on the box and grunstein arrived at strasbourg at colonel chariot's about half-past five transferred half an hour after in a hackney coach to the citadel sunday eighteenth they come to fetch me at half-past one in the morning they do not give me time to dress i embrace my unhappy companions my servants i leave alone with two officers of gendarmes and two gendarmes colonel chariot told me that we were going to the general of division who has received orders from paris instead of that i find a carriage with six post-horses in the church square lieutenant petermann gets in beside me blittersdorf the quartermaster on the box two gendarmes inside the other out here the shipwrecked man on the point of being engulfed interrupts his log the carriage arrived at about four o'clock in the evening at one of the barriers of the capital where the strasbourg road ends and instead of driving into paris followed the outer boulevard and stopped at vincennes castle the prince alighted from the carriage in the inner courtyard and was taken to a room of the fortress where he was locked in and went to sleep as the prince was approaching paris bonaparte affected an air of calmness which was not natural on the eighteenth of march which was palm sunday he went to the malmaison madame bonaparte who with all her family was informed of the prince's arrest spoke to him of this arrest bonaparte replied you don't understand politics colonel savary had become one of bonaparte's intimates why because he had seen the first consul weep at marengo exceptional men should distrust their tears which place them beneath the yoke of vulgar men tears are one of those weaknesses which enable an eyewitness to make himself master of a great man's resolutions they say that the first consul himself had all the orders for vincennes drawn up one of these orders provided that if the expected sentence was a death sentence it was to be executed on the spot i believe this version although i cannot vouch for its truth since those orders are missing madame de remusat who was playing chess with the first consul at the malmaison on the evening of the twentieth of march heard him mutter some verses on the clemency of augustus she thought that bonaparte was coming to himself again and that the prince was saved no destiny had pronounced its oracle when savary reappeared at malmaison madame bonaparte divined the whole misfortune the first consul had locked himself up alone for many hours and then the wind blew and all was ended an order of bonaparte dated twenty ninth ventors year twelve had decreed that a military commission consisting of seven members appointed by general the governor of paris should meet at vincennes to try the ci-devant duc d'enghien accused of bearing arms against the republic etc in fulfilment of this decree joachim murat on the same day twenty ninth ventors 
appointed the seven officers who were to form the said commission namely general hulin commanding the foot grenadiers of the consular guard president colonel guiton commanding the first regiment of cuirassiers colonel bazancourt commanding the fourth regiment of light infantry colonel ravier commanding the eighteenth regiment of infantry of the line colonel barrois commanding the ninety sixth regiment of infantry of the line colonel rab commanding the second regiment of the municipal guard of paris citizen d'autancourt major of the gendarmerie d'élite with the functions of captain judge advocate captain d'autancourt major jacquin of the légion d'élite two foot gendarmes of the same corps leva and tarsis and citizen noirot a lieutenant in the same corps went to the duc d'enghien's and awoke him he had but four hours to wait before returning to his sleep the judge advocate assisted by molin a captain in the eighteenth regiment chosen as registrar by the aforesaid judge advocate examined the prince asked his surname christian names age and birthplace answered that his name was louis antoine henri de bourbon duc d'enghien born second august seventeen seventy two at chantilly asked where he had resided since he left france answered that after accompanying his relations conde's corps having been formed he had served through the whole war and that before that he had been through the campaign of seventeen ninety two in brabant with bourbon's corps asked if he had not gone to england and if that power did not still allow him a salary answered that he had never been there that england still allowed him his pay which was all he had to live upon asked what rank he filled in conde's army answered commander of the advance guard in seventeen ninety six before that campaign as a volunteer at his grandfather's headquarters and ever since seventeen ninety six commander of the advance guard asked if he knew general pichegru and if he had had relations with him answered i have never seen him to my knowledge i have had no relations with him i know that he wished to see me i am glad that i never knew him because of the base methods which he is said to have wished to employ if true asked if he knew ex-general du Mouret, and if he had had relations with him answered not with him either whence continues the report were drawn up these presents which have been signed by the duc d'enghien major jacquin lieutenant noirot the two gendarmes and captain judge advocate before signing this present report the duc d'enghien said i earnestly make a request to be granted a private audience of the first consul my name my rank my way of thinking and the horror of my situation make me hope that he will not refuse my request at two o'clock on the morning of the twenty first of march the duc d'enghien was taken to the room in which the commission sat and repeated what he had said in examination by the judge advocate he persisted in his declaration he added that he was willing to make war and that he wished for service in the new war of england against france asked whether he had anything to put forward in the plea of his defence answered that he had nothing more to say the president ordered the prisoner to withdraw the colonel deliberated with closed doors the president took the votes commencing with the junior in rank next the president having given his opinion last the duc d'enghien was unanimously declared guilty and the court applied article of the law of the thus worded and in consequence condemned him to the penalty of death ordered on the demand of the captain judge advocate that the present sentence after being read to the condemned man shall be executed directly in presence of the different detachments of the corps of the garrison given concluded and tried at one sitting at vincennes on the day month and year as above as witness our hands the grave having been dug filled up and closed ten years of forgetfulness of general assent and of unexampled glory sat down upon it the grass sprang up to the sound of the salvos which proclaimed victories by the light of the illuminations which shed their lustre over the pontifical coronation the marriage of the daughter of the caesars and the birth of the king of rome only some rare sympathizers rambled in the wood hazarding a furtive glance at the bottom of the moat in the direction of the lamentable spot while a few prisoners watched them from the top of the donjon in which they were confined then came the restoration the earth of the tomb was stirred and with it men's consciences each then thought it his duty to explain himself m dupin the elder published his discussion m hulin the president of the military commission spoke m le duc de rovigo entered into the controversy by accusing m de talleyrand a third party replied on behalf of m de talleyrand and napoleon raised his mighty voice on the rock of st helena these documents must be reproduced and studied in order to assign to each the part due to him and the place which he should occupy in this drama it is night and we are at chantilly it was night when the duc d'enghien was at vincennes when m dupin published his pamphlet he sent it to me with the following letter 
Paris, 10th November, 1823. Monsieur le Vicomte, pray accept a copy of my publication relative to the murder of the Duc d'Anguien. It would have appeared long ago, had I not desired above all to respect the wish of Monseigneur le Duc de Bourbon, who, having been informed of my work, had communicated to me his desire that this deplorable affair might not be disinterred. But Providence, having permitted others to take the initiative, it has become necessary to make the truth known, and after assuring myself that it was no longer insisted that I should remain silent, I have spoken with frankness and sincerity. I have the honour to be, with profound respect, Monsieur le Vicomte, Your Excellency's most humble and obedient servant, Dupin. Monsieur Dupin, whom I congratulated and thanked, revealed in his covering letter an unknown and touching instance of the noble and merciful virtues of the victim's father. Monsieur Dupin commences his pamphlet thus. The death of the unfortunate Duke d'Anguien is one of the most afflicting events that ever befell the French nation. It dishonoured the consular government. A young prince, in the flower of his age, surprised by treachery on foreign soil, where he was sleeping in peace under the protection of the law of nations, dragged violently to France, indicted before pretended judges, who could in no case be his, accused of imaginary crimes, denied the assistance of counsel, examined and sentenced behind closed doors, put to death at night in the moat of the castle which was used as a state prison, so many virtues unheeded, such fond hopes destroyed, will ever stamp this catastrophe as one of the most revolting acts that an absolute government ever ventured to commit. If no form was respected, if the judges were incompetent, if they did not even take the trouble to mention in their judgment the date and text of the laws upon which they affected to ground their condemnation, if the unhappy Duc d'Anguien was shot in pursuance of a sentence signed in blank, and only made regular after execution, then we have to do not only with the innocent victim of judicial error. The thing assumes its true name. It is an odious murder. This eloquent exordium brings M. Dupin to the examination of the documents. He first proves the illegality of the arrest. The Duc d'Anguien was not arrested in France. He was in no way a prisoner of war, since he had not been taken with arms in his hands. He was not a prisoner in the civil sense, for no extradition had been demanded. It was a violent seizure of the person, comparable to the captures made by the pirates of Tunis and Algiers, an inroad of robbers, in Curcio Latronum. The jurist proceeds to discuss the incompetency of the military commission. Cognizance of alleged plots, hatch against the state, has never been conferred upon military commissions. Next follows the analysis of the judgment. The examination, continues M. Dupin, took place on the twenty-ninth Ventors at midnight. On the thirtieth Ventors, at two o'clock in the morning, the Duc d'Anguien was brought before the military commission. On the minutes of the judgment we read, this day the thirtieth Ventors, year twelve of the Republic, at two o'clock in the morning. The words at two o'clock in the morning, which were only inserted because it was in fact that time, are obliterated on the minutes without being replaced by any other indication. Not a single witness was heard or produced against the prisoner. The accused was declared guilty. Guilty of what? The judgment does not say. Every judgment that pronounces a penalty is bound to contain a reference to the law by virtue of which such penalty is inflicted. Well, in this case, none of these forms has been fulfilled. Nothing in the official report bears witness that the commissioners had a copy of the law before them. Nothing shows that the President read the text of the law before applying it. Far from it. The judgment in its material form affords the proof that the commissioners convicted without knowing either the date or the tenor of the law, for, in the minutes of the judgment, they have left in blank the date of the law, the number of the article, and the place in which the precise words should have been quoted, and yet it was on the minutes of a sentence framed in this state of imperfection that the noblest blood was shed by butchers. The deliberation must be secret, but the judgment must be pronounced in public. Again, it is the law that speaks. Now, the judgment of the 30th Fontos certainly says the council deliberated with closed doors, but it does not mention that the doors were opened again, or intimate that the result of the deliberation was pronounced in a public sitting. Even had it said so, who would believe it? A public sitting at two o'clock in the morning, in the donjon of Vincennes, while all the issues of the castle were being guarded by gendarmes d'élite. But the fact is that they did not even take the precaution to resort to a lie. The judgment is silent on this point. This judgment is signed by the President and the six other commissioners, including the judge advocate. But observe that the minutes are not signed by the registrar, whose concurrence, however, is necessary to give them authenticity. The sentence concludes with this terrible formula, shall be executed forthwith, under the care of the captain judge advocate. 
forthwith cruel word the work of the judges forthwith and an express law that of the fifteenth brumaire year six granted the right of appeal for a new trial against any military judgment passing to the execution m dupin continues as follows examined at night and tried at night the duc d'enghien was also killed at night this horrible sacrifice was to be consummated in the dark in order that it might be said that all laws had been infringed all even those which prescribe that executions shall take place in public the jurors come as to the irregularities in the preliminaries article nineteen of the law of the thirteenth brumaire year five declares that after closing the examination the judge advocate shall tell the prisoner to choose a friend as his defender the prisoner shall have the power to choose that defender among every class of citizen present on the spot if he declares that he is unable to make that choice the judge advocate shall make it for him ah no doubt the prince had no friends among those who surrounded him this fact was cruelly declared to him by one of the abettors of that horrible scene alas why were we not present why was the prince not allowed to make an appeal to the bar of paris there he would have found friends of his unhappiness defenders of his misfortune it was apparently with a view to making the judgment presentable in the eyes of the public that a new edition was drawn up at leisure the tardy substitution of a second form of judgment in appearance more regular than the first although equally unjust in no way detracts from the heinousness of having put the duc d'enghien to death by virtue of a rough draught of a judgment hastily signed and not even signed by all the requisite parties such is m dupin's luminous pamphlet nevertheless i do not know that in an act of the nature of that which the author examines the greater or lesser regularity holds an important place whether the duc d'enghien was strangled in a post-chaise between strasbourg and paris or killed in the wood of vincennes makes no difference but is it not providential to see men after long years some showing the irregularity of a murder in which they had taken no part others hastening unasked to the bar of public accusal what then have they heard what voice from on high has summoned them to appear after the great jurist here comes a blind veteran he has commanded the grenadiers of the old guard what that means brave men know his last wound he received from Malais, whose powerless lead remained lost in a face which had never turned from the fire. Afflicted with blindness, withdrawn from the world, consoled only by the care of his family, to use his own words, the judge of the Duc d'Enghien appears to issue from his tomb at the call of the sovereign judge. He pleads his cause without self-delusion or excuses. Let there be no mistake, he says, as to my intentions. I am not writing through fear, since my person is under the protection of laws emanating from the throne itself, and since, under the government of a righteous king, I have nothing to dread from violence or lawlessness. I write to tell the truth, even in what may be to my own detriment, so I do not pretend to justify even the form or the substance of the judgment, but I wish to show under what a powerful union of circumstances it was delivered. I wish to remove from myself and my colleagues the suspicion of having acted as party men, if we are still to receive blame i wish also that men should say of us they were very unfortunate general hulin asserts that he was appointed president of a military commission without knowing its object that when he arrived at vincennes he was no wiser that the other members of the commission knew as little that m ayel the governor of the castle told him on being asked that he knew nothing himself adding what can i do i am nobody here now everything is done without my orders or participation another man is in command here it was ten o'clock at night when general hulin was relieved from his uncertainty by the communication of the documents the hearing was opened at midnight when the examination of the prisoner by the judge advocate had been finished the reading of the documents says the president of the commission gave rise to an incident we observe that at the end of his examination before the judge advocate the prince before signing wrote with his own hand some lines in which he expressed a wish to have an explanation with the first consul one of the members proposed that this request should be forwarded to the government the commission agreed but at the same moment general who had come and placed himself behind my chair pointed out to us that this request was inopportune moreover we found no provision in the law authorizing us to suspend judgment the commission therefore proceeded reserving to itself the right to satisfy the prisoner's wishes after the trial so far general hulin now in a pamphlet by the duc de rovigo we read the following passage there were indeed so many people that as i arrived among the last i found it difficult to make my way to the back of the president's chair where i ultimately placed myself and so it was the duc de rovigo who had placed himself behind the chair of the president but had he or any other not forming one of the commission the right to interfere in the proceedings of the commission and to point out that a request was inopportune 
let us hear the commander of the grenadiers of the old guard speak of the courage of the young son of the condes he was a judge of it i proceeded to examine the prisoner i must say that he stood up to us with a noble confidence spurned the accusation that he had been directly or indirectly implicated in a plot to assassinate the first consul but also admitted that he had borne arms against france saying with a courage and a pride which did not for a moment permit us in his own interest to shake him on this point that he had supported the rights of his family and that a conde could never re-enter france without arms in his hands my birth and convictions he added make me for ever the enemy of your government his resolute confessions distressed his judges to the utmost ten times did we give him the opportunity to revise his statements but throughout he persisted unshaken i perceive he said at intervals the honourable intentions of the members of the commission but i cannot avail myself of the terms they offer me and on being warned that military commissions judge without appeal i know that he replied and i am quite aware of the danger which i am running i only wish to have an interview with the first consul does the whole of our history contain a more pathetic page new france sitting in judgment upon old france doing homage to her presenting arms to her saluting her colours even while condemning her the tribunal set up in the fortress in which the great conde when a prisoner cultivated flowers the general of the grenadiers of bonaparte's guard seated face to face with the last descendant of the victor of rocroi feeling himself moved with admiration before the prisoner left without a defender and abandoned by the world questioning him while the sound of the grave-digger digging the grave mingled with the young soldier's firm replies a few days after the execution general ulan exclaimed oh the brave young man what courage i should like to die like that general ulan after speaking of the minutes and of the second edition of the judgment says as to the second edition the only true one as it did not convey the order for immediate execution but only for the immediate reading of the judgment to the condemned man the immediate execution could not have been the act of the commission but only of those who took upon themselves the responsibility of hastening the fatal execution alas our thoughts were engaged elsewhere the judgment was scarcely signed when i began to write a letter in which with the unanimous consent of the commission i wrote to inform the first consul of the desire which the prince had expressed to have an interview with him and also to entreat him to remit a penalty which the difficulty of our position did not permit us to elude at that moment a man who had never left the council hall and whom i would name at once did i not consider that even when defending myself i ought not to become an accuser approached me and asked what are you doing there i am writing to the first consul i replied to convey to him the wishes of the council and of the condemned man your business is done said he taking the pen this is now my affair i protest that i thought as did several of my colleagues that he meant to say this is my affair to inform the first consul taken in this sense the reply left us the hope that the information would be none the less conveyed and how could it have occurred to us that there was any one among us that had orders to neglect the formalities prescribed by law the whole secret of this mournful catastrophe lies in this deposition the veteran who in daily expectation of dying on the battlefield had learned from death the language of truth concludes with these final words i was talking of what had just happened in the lobby adjoining the hall in which we had deliberated separate conversations were going forward i was waiting for my carriage which had not been allowed to drive into the inner courtyard nor had those of the other members thus delaying my departure and theirs we were closed in none of us having means to communicate with the outside when an explosion was heard a terrible noise that resounded at the bottom of our souls and froze them with terror and affright yes i swear in the name of all my colleagues that this execution was not authorized by us our judgment stated that a copy of it should be sent to the minister for war to the chief judge the minister for justice and to the general-in-chief the governor of paris the order of execution could be given regularly only by the last named the copies had not yet been dispatched they could not be finished before a portion of the day had elapsed on my return to paris i should have gone in search of the governor the first consul anybody and suddenly a dreadful sound comes to reveal to us that the prince no longer lives we did not know whether he who so cruelly hastened on this fatal execution had orders if he had none he alone was responsible if he had orders the commission knowing nothing of those orders the commission forcibly and illegally detained the commission whose last wish was for the prince's safety could neither foresee nor prevent their effect it cannot be accused of the result the lapse of twenty years has not allayed the bitterness of my regret let me be accused of ignorance of error i acquiesce let me be reproached with an obedience from which to-day under similar circumstances i should certainly know how to escape with my attachment to a man whom i thought destined to promote the happiness of my country with my loyalty to a government which i then considered lawful and which had received my oath but let some allowance be made to me and also to my colleagues for the fatal circumstances under which we were summoned to decide a weak defence but you repent general peace be with you 
if your sentence became the marching orders of the last of the condes you will join the last conscript of our old motherland in the advance guard of the dead the young soldier will gladly share his couch with the grenadier of the old guard the france of freiburg and the france of marengo will sleep together m le duc de rovigo beating his breast takes his place in the procession that comes to confess at the tomb i had long been under the power of the minister of police he fell under the influence which he supposed to be restored to me on the return of the legitimacy he communicated a portion of his memoirs to me men in his position speak with wonderful candour of what they have done they have no idea of what they are saying against themselves accusing themselves without perceiving it they do not suspect the existence of an opinion differing from theirs both as regards the functions which they had undertaken and the line of conduct which they have observed if they have been wanting in loyalty they do not think that they have broken their oath if they have taken upon themselves parts which are repugnant to other characters they believe that they have done great services their ingenuousness does not justify them but it excuses them m le duc de rovigo consulted me on the chapters in which he treats of the death of the duc d'enghien he wished to know my mind precisely because he knew how i had acted i value this mark of his esteem and repaying frankness with frankness i advised him to publish nothing leave all this said i to die out in france oblivion is not slow in coming you imagine that you will clear napoleon of a reproach and throw back the fault upon m de talleyrand but you do not sufficiently exonerate the former nor do you sufficiently accuse the latter you lay yourself open to attack from your enemies they will not fail to reply to you why need you remind the public that you were in command of the gendarmerie d'élite at vincennes they were not aware of the direct part which you played in this fatal deed and now you tell them of it throw the manuscript into the fire general i speak in your own interest steeped in the maxims of the imperial government the duc de rovigo thought that those maxims could be as well applied to the legitimate throne he felt convinced that his pamphlet would reopen the doors of the tuileries to him it is partly by the light of this publication that posterity will trace the outlines of the phantoms of grief i offered to hide the suspect who had come to our shelter of me during the night he did not accept the protection of my house m de rovigo tells the story of the departure of m de colincourt whom he does not mention by name he speaks of the kidnapping at ettenheim the prisoners passing through strasbourg and his arrival at vincennes after an expedition on the coast of normandy general savary had returned to the Malmaison. he was summoned at five o'clock in the evening of the nineteenth of march eighteen o four to the closet of the first consul who handed him a sealed letter to be carried to general murat the governor of paris he flew to the general crossing with the minister of foreign relations on his way and received the order to take the gendarmerie d'élite and go to vincennes he went there at eight o'clock in the evening in time to see the members of the commission arrive he soon made his way into the hall where the prince was being tried at one o'clock in the morning of the twenty first and took a seat behind the president he gives the duc d'enghien's replies in about the same terms as they are given in the report of the one sitting he told me that the prince after making his final explanations with a quick movement took off his cap laid it on the table and with the air of a man resigning his life said to the president i have nothing more to say sir m de rovigo insists upon it that this sitting was in no way secret the doors of the hall he declares were open and free to any who cared to attend at that hour m dupin had already pointed out the confusion of this argument in this connection m achille roche who appears to write for m de talleyrand exclaims the sitting was in no way secret at midnight held in the inhabited portion of the castle in the inhabited portion of a prison who then was present at this sitting jailers soldiers executioners no one was in a position to give more exact details concerning the moment and place of the thunderclap than m le duc de rovigo let us hear what he says after sentence had been pronounced i withdrew with the officers of my corps who like myself had been present during the proceedings and joined the troops stationed on the esplanade of the castle the officer who commanded the infantry of my legion came and told me with deep emotion that a piquet of men was required of him to execute the sentence of the military commission give it i replied but where am i to post it where you may be sure to hurt nobody for already the roads were full of inhabitants of the populous environs of paris on their way to attend the different markets after carefully examining the ground the officer chose the moat as the place where there was least danger of any one being hurt m le duc d'enghien was taken there by the stairs of the entrance tower on the park side and there heard the sentence pronounced which was put into effect below this paragraph the author of the memorial appends the following footnote between the passing of the sentence and its execution a grave was dug which gave rise to the report that it had been prepared prior to the judgment unfortunately we meet here with deplorable inaccuracies m de rovigo contends says m achille roche m de talleyrand's apologist that he obeyed orders who
who conveyed to him the order for the execution it appears that it was a certain m delga killed at bagram but whether it be m delga or not if m savary is mistaken in mentioning m delga to us no one doubtless to-day will lay claim to the fame conferred upon that officer m de rovigo is accused of having hastened the execution it was not he he replies a man who is now dead told him that orders had been given to hasten it the duke de rovigo is not well inspired on the subject of the execution which he describes as taking place in daylight that would besides have altered nothing in the fact and would simply mean the absence of a torch at the punishment at the hour of sunrise in the open air asked the general what need was there for a lantern to see a man at six paces not that the sun he adds was altogether bright and clear a fine rain had fallen all night and a damp mist still retarded in some degree its appearance the execution took place at six o'clock in the morning this fact is witnessed by irrefutable documents but the general neither produces these documents nor tells us where to find them the course of the trial shows that the duc d'enghien was tried at two o'clock in the morning and shot forthwith those words two o'clock in the morning which originally appeared on the first minutes of the sentence were subsequently erased from the minutes the official report of the exhumation proves by the depositions of three witnesses madame bon the sieur godard and the sieur bounelet the latter had helped to dig the grave that the death penalty was effected at night m dupin the elder records the circumstance of a lantern fastened over the duc d'enghien's heart to serve as a mark or held with the same object in the prince's firm hand stories were told of a heavy stone taken from the grave with which the victim's head was crushed in lastly the duc de rovigo is supposed to have boasted of possessing some of the spoils of the sacrifice i myself have believed in these rumours but the legal documents prove that they were unfounded from the official report dated wednesday the twentieth of march eighteen sixteen of the physicians and surgeons entrusted with the exhumation of the corpse it has been certified that the skull was broken that the upper jaw separated entirely from the facial bones contained twelve teeth that the lower jaw fractured in the middle was divided in two and showed only three teeth the body was lying flat upon its abdomen the head being lower than the feet there was a gold chain around the vertebrae of the neck the second official report of the exhumation of the same date twentieth march eighteen sixteen the general report states that with the remains of the skeleton were found a purse in morocco leather containing eleven pieces of gold seventy pieces of gold enclosed in sealed rolls some hair shreds of clothing remnants of his cap bearing marks of the bullets by which it had been pierced m de rovigo therefore took none of the spoils the earth which had held them has restored them and has borne witness to the general's honesty no lantern was fastened over the prince's heart its fragments would have been found as were those of the perforated cap no heavy stone was taken from the grave the fire of the piquet at six paces was enough to blow the head to pieces to separate the upper jaw from the facial bones and so on to complete this mockery of human vanities were needed only the similar immolation of murat the governor of paris the death of bonaparte in captivity and the inscription engraved upon the duc d'enghien's coffin here lies the body of the most high and mighty prince of the blood peer of france died at vincennes twenty first march eighteen o four aged thirty one years seven months and nineteen days the body was mere bare and shattered bones the high and mighty prince the broken fragments of a soldier's carcass not a word to recall the catastrophe not a word of blame or grief in this epitaph carved by a sorrowing family a prodigious result of the respect which the century shows to the works and susceptibilities of the revolution in the same way no time was lost in removing all traces of the mortuary chapel of the duc de berry what a sum total of annihilation bourbons who return to so little purpose to your palaces you have busied yourselves with naught save exhumations and funerals your time of life was past god has willed it so the ancient glory of france perished beneath the eyes of the shade of the great conde in a moat at vincennes perhaps at the very place where louis the ninth to whom men resorted as to a saint seated himself at the foot of an oak and where all who had any business with him came without ceremony and without hindrance from any usher or others and whenever he heard anything that could be amended in the speeches of those who pleaded for others he most graciously corrected it himself and all the people who had a cause to bring before him stood round him the duc d'enghien asked leave to speak to bonaparte he had a cause to bring before him he was not heard who standing at the edge of the ravelin looked down into the moat upon those muskets those soldiers dimly lighted by a lantern in the mist and gloom as in night everlasting where was the light placed did the duc d'enghien stand over his open grave was he obliged to step across it to place himself at the distance of six paces specified by the duc de rovigo there exists a letter written by m le duc d'enghien at the age of nine to his father the duc de bourbon where he says 
All the Enguians are lucky. The one of the Battle of Cerizon, the one who won the Battle of Rocroi. I hope to be so too. Is it true that the victim was refused a priest? Is it true that he only with difficulty found a hand willing to convey to a woman a last pledge of affection? What did the executioners care for sentiments of religion or love? They were there to kill, the Duc d'Enguien to die. The Duc d'Enguien had been secretly married, through the offices of a priest, to the Princesse Charlotte de Rouen. In those days, of a roving motherland, a man, by the very reason of his elevation, was impeded by a thousand political obstacles. To enjoy that which society accords to all, he was obliged to hide himself. This lawful marriage, to-day no more a secret, enhances the splendour of a tragic doom. It substitutes the glory for the clemency of heaven. Religion perpetuates the pomp of misfortune when, after the catastrophe has been accomplished, the cross rises on the deserted spot. M. de Talleyrand, according to M. de Rovigo's pamphlet, had presented a vindicatory memorial to Louis the Eighteenth. This memorial, which I have not seen, should have thrown light upon everything, and threw light upon nothing. In 1820, when I was appointed Minister Plenipotentiary to Berlin, I discovered in the archives of the embassy a letter from the citizen La Forest, addressed to the citizen Talleyrand, on the subject of the Duc d'Enguien. And this strongly worded letter does its author the more credit, in that he did not fear to compromise his career, without earning the reward of public opinion, since the step he had taken was to remain unknown, a noble act of self-denial on the part of a man who, through his very obscurity, had relegated to obscurity the good which he had done. M. de Talleyrand took his lesson, and kept silence. At least, I found nothing from him in the same archives concerning the death of the prince. The Minister of Foreign Relations had nevertheless, on the second Vontors, informed the Minister of the Elector of Baden, that the First Consul had thought it necessary to order some detachments to proceed to Offenburg and Ettenheim, there to seize the instigators of the scandalous conspiracies which, by their character, place without the pale of the law of nations all those who have manifestly taken part in them. A passage from Generals Gorgo, Montalon, and D. Ward brings Bonaparte upon the scene. My minister, says the latter, strongly represented to me the need for seizing the Duc d'Enguerne, although he was upon neutral territory. But I continued to hesitate, and the Prince de Benevon twice brought me the order for his arrest for signature. Nevertheless, I consented to sign it, only after convincing myself of the urgency of this act. According to the Memorial de Sainte-Hélène, the following words must have dropped from Bonaparte. The Duc d'Enguerne bore himself before the tribunal with great gallantry. On his arrival at Strasbourg, he wrote me a letter. This letter was handed to Talleyrand, who kept it until the execution. I have no great belief in this letter. Napoleon probably turned into a letter the request made by the Duc d'Enguerne to speak to the conqueror of Italy, or rather the few lines expressing this request which, before signing the examination undergone before the judge advocate, the prince had written with his own hand. Nevertheless, the fact that this letter was not to be found should not lead us too vigorously to conclude that it was never written. I know, says the Duc de Rovigo, that in the early days of the Restoration, in 1814, one of M. de Talleyrand's secretaries was incessantly making researches in the archives under the gallery of the museum. I have this fact from the man who received the order to pass him in. The same thing was done at the repository of the War Office, for the documents of the trial of M. le Duc d'Enguien, of which only the sentence remained. The fact is true. All the diplomatic papers, and notably the correspondence of M. de Talleyrand with the Emperor and the First Consul, were transferred from the archives of the museum to the house in the Rue Saint-Florentin. Part of them were destroyed. The remainder were put into a stove, to which they forgot to set light. This was all that the minister's prudence could do against the prince's indifference. The documents that were not burned were recovered. Someone thought it was right to preserve them. I have held in my hands and read with my eyes a letter from M. de Talleyrand, dated 8th March, 1804, and treating of the arrest, not yet carried out, of M. le Duc d'Enguerne. The minister invites the First Consul to deal vigorously with his enemies. I was not permitted to keep the letter, and I have retained only these two passages in my memory. If justice obliges us to punish vigorously, policy exacts that we should punish without exception. I will suggest to the First Consul, M. de Colincourt, to whom he might give his orders, and who would execute them, with as much discretion as fidelity. Will this report of the Prince de Talleyrand one day be published in full? I do not know, but what I do know is that it was in existence no more than two years ago. There was a meeting of the council for the arrest of the Duc d'Enguerre. Cambacérès, in his unpublished memoirs, declares, and I believe him, that he opposed the arrest, but while recording what he said, he does not say what the others replied. For the rest, the Memorial de Saint-Hélène denies the entreaties for mercy to which Bonaparte is said to have been exposed. The pretended scene of Josephine on her knees asking for pardon for the Duc d'Enguerne, clinging to the skirt of her husband's coat, 
and allowing that inexorable husband to drag her about is one of those melodramatic inventions with which our latter-day fabulists compose veracious history josephine did not know on the evening of the nineteenth of march that the duc d'enghien was to be judged she only knew that he had been arrested she had promised madame de remusat to interest herself in the prince's fate as his lady was returning to the Mamaison with josephine on the evening of the nineteenth it was noticed that the future empress instead of being preoccupied solely with the perils of the prisoner of vincennes frequently put her head to the window of the carriage to look out at her general riding in her suite a woman's coquetry had carried elsewhere the thought which might have saved the duc d'enghien's life it was not until the twenty first of march that bonaparte said to his wife the duc d'enghien has been shot these memoirs of madame de remusat whom i have known contained extremely curious details on the inner life of the imperial court the author burnt them during the hundred days and afterwards wrote them anew they are now no more than memories reproduced by memories their colour has faded but bonaparte is throughout exposed to the light and judged with impartiality men attached to napoleon say that he knew of the death of the duc d'enghien only after the prince's execution this story would seem to derive some value from the anecdote related by the duc de rovigo concerning Réal's going to vincennes if the anecdote were true once the death had taken place through the intrigues of the revolutionary party bonaparte recognised the accomplished fact so as not to irritate men whom he thought powerful this ingenious explanation is not admissible now to resume these facts here is what they have proved to me bonaparte wished the duc d'enghien's death no one had made that death a condition of his mounting the throne to suppose this condition is one of the subtleties of the politicians who claim to find occult causes for everything nevertheless it is probable that certain compromised persons did not without a certain pleasure see the first consul sever himself for good from the bourbons the vincennes sentence was an instance of bonaparte's violent temperament an outburst of cold anger fed by the reports of his minister m de colincourt is guilty only of having executed the order for the arrest murat has to reproach himself only with conveying general orders and with not having had the strength to withdraw he was not at vincennes during the trial the duc de rovigo found himself charged with the execution he probably had secret orders general hulin hints as much what man would have dared to take upon himself to order the execution forthwith of a sentence of death upon the duc d'enghien if he had not acted on an imperative mandate as to m de talleyrand priest and nobleman he inspired and prepared the murder by persistently alarming bonaparte he feared the return of the legitimacy it would be possible by collecting what napoleon said at st helena and the letters written by the bishop of autun to prove that the latter took a very great part in the death of the duc d'enghien it would be vain to object that the minister's light-heartedness character and education ought to make him averse to violence that his corruption ought to take away his energy it would remain none the less a fact that he persuaded the consul to the fatal arrest this arrest of the duc d'enghien on the fifteenth of march was not unknown to m de talleyrand he was in daily communication with bonaparte and conferred with him during the interval that elapsed between the arrest and the execution did m de talleyrand he the instigating minister repent did he say a single word to the first consul in favour of the unhappy prince it is natural to believe that he applauded the execution of the sentence the military commission sentenced the duc d'enghien but with sorrow and repentance this conscientiously impartially and strictly considered is the exact part played by each my fate has been too closely connected with this catastrophe that i should not endeavour to throw light upon its dark places and to lay bare its details if bonaparte had not killed the duc d'enghien if he had brought me closer and closer to him and his inclination prompted him to do so what would have been the result for me my literary career would have been ended i should at one jump have entered the political career in which i have proved what i could have done by the spanish war and i should have become rich and powerful france might have been the gainer by my association with the emperor i should have been the loser possibly i might have succeeded in maintaining some ideas of liberty and moderation in the great man's head but my life ranking among those which are called happy would have been deprived of that which has constituted its character and its honour poverty strife and independence lastly the principal accused rises after all the others he brings up the rear of the blood-stained penitents suppose that a judge were to have brought up before him the man named bonaparte as the captain judge advocate had brought up before him the man named d'enghien suppose that the minutes of the late examination copied upon the former had been preserved to us compare and read asked his surname and christian names answered that his name was napoleon bonaparte asked where he had resided since he had left france 
answered at the pyramids in berlin madrid vienna moscow st helena asked what rank he filled in the army answered commander in the advance guard of the armies of god no other reply issues from the prisoner's lips the different actors in the tragedy mutually accused each other bonaparte alone throws the blame for it upon nobody he preserves his greatness beneath the weight of malediction he does not bow his head but stands erect he exclaims with the stoic pain i will never admit that thou art an evil but that which in his pride he refuses to admit to the living he is constrained to confess to the dead this prometheus with the vulture at his breast who stole the fire from heaven thought himself superior to all things and he is compelled to reply to the duc d'enghien whom he has made into dust before his time the skeleton the trophy over which he stumbled questions him and dominates him by a providential dispensation personal attendance and the army the ante-room and the tent had their representatives at st helena a servant estimable for his fidelity to the master he had chosen had come to place himself near napoleon as an echo at his service simplicity repeated the fable while giving it an accent of sincerity bonaparte was destiny like the latter he deceived men's fascinated minds in outward form but at the bottom of his impostures this inexorable truth was heard to resound i am and the universe felt its weight the author of the most credited work on st helena sets forth the theory which napoleon invented for the murderer's benefit the voluntary exile accepts as gospel truth and homicidal talk with pretensions to profundity which would only explain napoleon's life as he wished to arrange it and as he contended that it should be written he left instructions for his neophytes m le comte de las cases learnt his lesson without being aware of it the stupendous captive wandering along solitary paths drew his credulous worshipper after him by means of lies even as hercules hung men to his mouth by chains of gold the first time says the honest chamberlain that i heard napoleon pronounce the name of the duc d'enghien i turned red with embarrassment fortunately i was walking behind him in a narrow path otherwise he would certainly have observed my confusion nevertheless when the emperor for the first time developed the whole of this incident with all its details and accessories when he set forth his various motives with his close luminous persuasive reasoning i must confess that the matter seemed to me gradually to assume a new aspect the emperor often resumed this subject which gave me an opportunity of observing in him certain very pronounced shades of character i was able on this occasion and repeatedly most distinctly to see in him the private individual struggling with the public man and the natural sentiments of his heart contending against those of his pride and of the dignity of his position in the confidence of intimacy he did not show himself indifferent to the unfortunate prince's fate but so soon as it became a question of the public it was quite a different thing one day after talking with me of the untimely end and of the youth of this ill-fated man he concluded by saying and i have since learnt my dear fellow that he was rather in my favour i have been told that he spoke of me with some admiration such is retributive justice here below and the last words were spoken with so much feeling all the features of his face displayed such harmony with the words that if he whom napoleon was pitying had at that moment been in his power i am quite sure that whatever his intentions or his acts he would have been eagerly pardoned the emperor used to consider this matter from two very different points of view that of common law or the established rules of justice and that of the law of nature or acts of violence to us in the intimacy of private conversation the emperor would say that the blame in france might be ascribed to an excess of zeal in those around him or to private objects or mysterious intrigues he said that he had been precipitately urged in this affair that they had as it were taken his mind unawares hastened his measures anticipated their result without doubt he said if i had been informed in time of certain particulars concerning the prince's opinions and disposition more still if i had seen the letter which he wrote to me and which god knows for what reason was not handed to me until after he was no more i should most certainly have pardoned him it was easy for us to see that it was the emperor's heart and nature alone which dictated these words and that they were intended only for us for he would have felt humiliated to think that any one could for an instant believe that he was trying to shift the burden from his own shoulders or condescending to justify himself his fear in this respect or his susceptibility was such that in speaking of it to strangers or dictating on this matter for the public he confined himself to saying that if he had known of the prince's letter he would perhaps have pardoned him in view of the great political advantages which he could have derived from it and when writing with his own hand his last thoughts which he concludes will be recorded in the present age and reach posterity he states with reference to this subject which he regards as one of the most delicate for his memory that if it were to be done over again he would do it again 
this passage in so far as the writer is concerned possesses all the characteristics of the most perfect sincerity this shines through to the very phrase in which m le comte de las cases declared that bonaparte would have eagerly pardoned a man who was not guilty but the theories of the master are subtleties by aid of which an effort is made to reconcile the irreconcilable in making the distinction between common law or established justice and natural law or the errors of violence napoleon seemed to be content with a piece of sophistry which in reality did not content him he was unable to subject his conscience as he had subjected the world a weakness natural to superior men and to little men when they have committed a fault is to wish to represent it as a work of genius a vast combination beyond the understanding of the vulgar pride says those things and folly believes them bonaparte doubtless regarded as the mark of the ruling mind the sentence which he delivered in his great man's compunction my dear fellow such is retributive justice here below o oh, truly philosophical emotion what impartiality how well it justifies by laying it to the charge of destiny the evil which has sprung from ourselves a man nowadays thinks it an all-sufficient excuse to exclaim after all it was my nature it was the infirmity of mankind when he has killed his father he repeats i am made like that and the crowd stands open-mouthed and they examine the mighty man's bumps and they recognize that he was made like that and what care i that you are made like that must i submit to this manner of being the world would be a fine chaos if all the men who are made like that were to take it into their heads to force themselves one upon the other those who are unable to wipe out their errors deify them they make a dogma of their evil doing they turn acts of sacrilege into religion and they would think themselves apostates were they to renounce the cult of their iniquities there is a serious lesson to be drawn from bonaparte's life two actions both bad began and caused his fall the death of the duc d'enghien and the war with spain it was vain for him to ride over them with his glory they remained there to ruin him he perished on the very side in which he thought himself strong profound invincible when he violated the moral law while neglecting and scorning his real strength that is his superior qualities of order and equity so long as he confined himself to attacking anarchy and foreigners hostile to france he was victorious he found himself robbed of his vigour so soon as he entered upon the paths of corruption the shaving of the locks by delilah is nothing other than the loss of virtue every crime bears within itself a radical incapacity and a germ of misfortune let us then practise good to be happy and let us be just to be able in proof of this truth observe that at the very moment of the prince's death commenced the descent which growing in proportion to ill fortune decided the fall of the ordainer of the tragedy of vincennes the russian cabinet in reference to the arrest of the duc d'enghien addressed vigorous representations against the violation of the territory of the empire bonaparte felt the blow and replied in the monitor with a fulminating article bringing up the death of paul i a funeral service had been celebrated in st petersburg for young conde on the cenotaph was read to the duc d'enghien quem devoravit belua corsica the two mighty adversaries subsequently became reconciled in appearance but the mutual wound which policy had inflicted and insult enlarged remained in their hearts napoleon did not think himself revenged until he came to sleep in moscow alexander was not satisfied before he entered paris the hatred of the cabinet of berlin arose from the same origin i have spoken of the noble letter of m de la forest in which he told m de talleyrand of the effect which the murder of the duc d'enghien had produced at the court of potsdam madame de steel was in prussia when the news from vincennes arrived i was living in berlin he said on the spree quay and my apartment was on the ground floor at eight o'clock one morning they woke me to tell me that prince louis ferdinand was under my windows on horseback and asked me to come and speak to him do you know he asked that the duc d'enghien has been kidnapped on baden territory handed over to a military commission and shot within four-and-twenty hours after his arrival in paris what nonsense i replied do you not see that this can only be a rumour spread by the enemies of france in fact i admit that my hatred of bonaparte strong as it was did not go so far as to make me credit the possibility of his committing so great a crime as you doubt what i tell you replied prince louis i will send you the monitor in which you can read the sentence with these words he left me and the expression of his face was the presage of vengeance or death a quarter of an hour later i had in my hands the monitor of the twenty first of march thirtieth pluvieuse which contained a sentence of death passed by the military commission sitting at vincennes upon the man called louis d'enghien it was thus that frenchmen described the descendant of heroes who were the glory of their country even if one were to abjure all the prejudices in favour of illustrious birth which the return of monarchical forms would necessarily recall 
was it possible thus to blaspheme the memories of the battle of Lens and of Rocroi? this bonaparte who has won so many battles does not even know how to respect them for him there is neither past nor future his imperious and scornful soul will recognize nothing for opinion to hold sacred he admits only respect for the force in power prince louis wrote to me beginning his note with these words the man called louis of prussia begs madame de steel etc he felt the insult offered to the blood royal whence he sprang to the memory of the heroes among whom he was longing to enrol himself how after this horrible deed could a single king in europe ally himself with such a man necessity you will say there is a sanctuary in the soul to which its empire may not penetrate were this not so what would virtue be upon this earth a liberal amusement suited only to the peaceful leisure of private men this resentment on the part of the prince for which he was to pay with his life was still lasting when the prussian campaign opened in eighteen o six frederick william in his manifesto of the ninth of october said the germans have not revenged the death of the duc d'enghien but the memory of that crime will never fade among them these historical particulars rarely observed deserve to be so for they explain enmities of which one would be puzzled to discover the primary cause elsewhere and at the same time they disclose the steps by which providence leads a man's destiny from the crime to the expiation happy at least my life which was not troubled by fear nor attacked by contagion nor carried away by examples the satisfaction which i experience to-day at what i did then is my warrant that my conscience is no illusion more content than all those potentates than all those nations fallen at the feet of the glorious soldier i turn again with pardonable pride to this page which i have retained as my only belonging and which i owe only to myself in eighteen o seven with my heart still moved by the murder which i have just related i wrote the following lines they caused the mercure to be suppressed and jeopardized my liberty once more when amid the silence of abjection no sound is heard save that of the chains of the slave and the voice of the informer when all tremble before the tyrant and when it is as dangerous to incur his favour as to deserve his displeasure the historian appears entrusted with the vengeance of the nations nero prospers in vain tacitus already is born within the empire he grows up unknown beside the ashes of germanicus and already a just providence has surrendered to an obscure child the glory of the master of the world if the historian's part is fine it is often dangerous but there are altars such as that of honour which although deserted demand further sacrifices the god is not annihilated because the temple is empty wherever there remains a chance for fortune there is no heroism in trying it magnanimous actions are those of which adversity and death are the foreseen result after all what do reverses matter if our name pronounced by posterity makes one generous heart beat two thousand years after our life the death of the duc d'enghien by introducing a new principle into bonaparte's conduct marred the correctness of his intelligence he was obliged to adopt as a shield maxims of which he had not the whole force at his disposal for his glory and his genius incessantly blunted them he was looked upon with suspicion with fear men lost confidence in him and in his destiny he was constrained to see if not to seek out men whom he would never have seen and who through his action considered themselves to have become his equals the contagion of their defilement was overtaking him his great qualities remained the same but his good dispositions became impaired and no longer upheld his great qualities under the influence of the corruption of that original stain his nature deteriorated god commanded his angels to disturb the harmonies of that world to change its laws to tilt it on its poles as milton says they with labour pushed oblique the centric globe some say the sun was bid turn reins from the equinoctial road like distant breadth boreas and caecus and argestes loud and thrascius rend the woods and seas upturn will the ashes of bonaparte be exhumed as were those of the duc d'enghien if i had been the master the latter victim would still be sleeping unhonoured in the moat of vincennes castle that excommunicated one would have been left like raymond of toulouse in an open coffin no man's hand would have dared to conceal beneath a plank the sight of the witness to the incomprehensible judgments and angers of god the abandoned skeleton of the duc d'enghien and napoleon's deserted tomb at st helena would be the counterpart of each other there would be nothing more commemorative than those remains face to face at opposite ends of the earth at least the duc d'enghien did not remain on foreign soil like the exiled of kings the latter took care to restore the former to his country a little harshly it is true but will it be for ever france how much dust winnowed by the breath of the revolution bears witness to it is not faithful to the bones of the dead old conde in his will declares that he is not sure which country he will be inhabiting on the day of his death o bossuet 
what would you not have added to the masterpiece of your eloquence if when you were speaking over the grave of the great conde you had been able to foresee the future it was at this very spot at chantilly that the duc d'enghien was born louis antoine henri de bourbon born second august seventeen seventy two at chantilly says the sentence of death it was on this lawn that he played in childhood the traces of his footsteps have become obliterated and the victor of freiburg of nordlingen of lenz of senef where has he gone with his victorious and now feeble hands and his descendants the conde of johannesburg and of bentheim and his son and his grandson where are they that castle those gardens those fountains which are silent neither by day nor by night what has become of them mutilated statues lions with a claw or a jaw restored trophies of arms sculptured in a crumbling wall escutcheons with obliterated fleur-de-lis foundations of raised turrets a few marble courses above the empty stables no longer livened by the neighing of the steed of roquoi near a riding-school a high unfinished gate that is what remains of the memories of an heroic race a will tied with a rope changed the onus of the inheritance the whole forest has repeatedly fallen under the axe persons of bygone times have run over those once resounding chases mute to-day what was their age what their passions when they stopped at the foot of those oaks oh my useless memoirs i should not now be able to say to you qu'à chantilly condé vous lise quelquefois qu'en guienne en soit touché obscure men that we are what are we beside those famous men we shall disappear never to return you sweet william who lie upon my table beside this paper whose belated little flower i have gathered among the heather will blossom again but we we shall not come to life again with the perfume solitary which has diverted my thoughts End of book three Book four, part one of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume two, part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume two, part two by François René de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book four, part one. Henceforth removed from active life, and nevertheless saved from Bonaparte's anger by the protection of Madame Bacciocchi i left my temporary lodging in the rue de beaune and went to live in the rue de miromesnil the little house which i hired was occupied later by m de lally tolondal and madame de nain his best beloved as they said in the days of diane de poitiers my garden abutted on a timber-yard and near my window i had a tall poplar tree which m de lally tolondal in order to breathe a less moist air himself felled with his coarse hand which to his eyes was transparent and fleshless it was an illusion like any other the pavement of the street at that time came to an end before my door high up the street or road wound across a piece of wasteland called the butte aux lapins or rabbit hill the butte aux lapins sprinkled with a few isolated houses joined on the right the jardin de tivoli whence i had set out with my brother for the emigration and on the left the parc de monceau i strolled pretty often in that abandoned park where the revolution had commenced among the orgies of the duc d'orleans this retreat had been embellished with marble nudities and mock ruins a symbol of the light and vicious policy which was about to cover france with prostitutes and wreckage i busied myself with nothing at the utmost i conversed in the park with some pine trees or talked of the duc d'enghien with three rooks at the edge of an artificial river hidden beneath a carpet of green moss deprived of my alpine legation and of my roman friendships even as i had been suddenly separated from my attachments in london i did not know how to dispose of my imagination and my feelings i sent them every evening after the sun and its rays were unable to carry them over the seas i returned indoors and tried to fall asleep to the sound of my poplar tree nevertheless my resignation had increased my reputation in france a little courage always looks well some of the members of madame de beaumont's former company introduced me to new country houses m de tocqueville my brother's brother-in-law and guardian of my two orphan nephews occupied madame de senozin's country seat on every hand were scaffold legacies there i saw my nephews grow up with their three tocqueville cousins among whom alexis the author of the democratie en amerique was prominent he was more spoilt at verneuil than i had been at combourg is this the last renown that i shall have seen unknown in its swaddling clothes alexis de tocqueville has travelled through the civilized america of which i have travelled through the forests verneuil has changed masters it has become the property of madame de saint fargo famous through her father 
and through the revolution which adopted her as its daughter near mantes at the menil was madame de rosambo my nephew louis de chateaubriand eventually married mademoiselle d'orglande there niece to madame de rosambo the latter no longer airs her beauty around the pond and under the beeches of the manor it has passed when i went from verneuil to the menil i came to mezy on the road madame de mezy was romance wrapped up in virtue and maternal grief if only her child which fell from a window and broke its head had been able like the young quails which we shot to fly over the chateau and take refuge in the Ile belle the smiling island of the seine cotonix perstipulas paskins on the other side of the seine not far from the marais madame de vintimille had introduced me to Maryville. Maryville was an oasis created by the smile of a muse but of one of those muses whom the gallic poets call the learned fairies here the adventures of blanca and of veleda were read before fashionable generations which falling one from the other like flowers to-day listen to the wailing of my years by degrees my brain wearying of rest in my rue de miromenil saw phantoms form before it in the distance the genie du christianisme inspired me with the idea of proving that work by mixing christian and mythological characters together a shade which long afterwards i called simo d'osse sketched itself vaguely in my head not one of its features was fixed simo d'osse once conceived i shut myself up with her as i always do with the daughters of my imagination but before they have issued from the dreamy state and arrived from the banks of lethe through the ivory portals they often change their shape if i create them through love i undo them through love and the one cherished object which i later present to the light is the offspring of a thousand infidelities i remained only a year in the rue de miromenil because the house was sold i arranged with madame la marquise de coilin who lent me the top floor of her house on the place louis XV madame de coilin was a woman of the grandest air she was nearly eighty years of age and her proud and domineering eyes bore an expression of wit and irony madame de coilin was in no way lettered and took pride in the fact she had passed through the voltairian age without being aware of it if she had conceived any idea of it whatever it was that of a time of a voluble middle class not that she ever spoke of her birth she was too great to make herself ridiculous she very well knew how to see small people without compromising her rank but after all she was born of the premier marquis of france if she was descended from drogon de nesle killed in palestine in ten ninety six from raoul de nesle the constable knighted by louis the ninth from jean the second de nesle regent of france during the last crusade of st louis madame de coilin vowed that this was a stupidity on the part of fate for which she ought not to be held responsible she was naturally of the court as others more happy are of the streets as one may be a thoroughbred mare or a cab hack she could not help this accident and had no choice but to endure the ill with which heaven had been pleased to afflict her had madame de coilin had relations with louis quinze she never owned so much to me she admitted however that she had been very much loved but she pretended that she had treated the royal lover with the utmost harshness i have seen him at my feet she would say to me he had charming eyes and his language was seductive he offered one day to give me a porcelain dressing-table like that which madame de pompadour had oh sire cried i then i must use it to hide under by a singular chance i came across this dressing-table at the marchioness cunningham's in london she had received it from george the fourth and showed it to me with amusing simplicity madame de coilin occupied in her house a room opening under the colonnade corresponding to the colonnade of the wardrobe two sea-pieces by vernet which louis the well-beloved had given to the noble dame were hung up on an old green satin tapestry madame de coilin remained lying till two o'clock in the afternoon in a large bed with curtains also of green silk seated and propped up by pillows a sort of nightcap badly fastened to her head allowed her grey hairs to escape sprigs of diamonds mounted in the old-fashioned way fell upon the shoulder-pieces of her bed-cloak all covered with snuff as in the time of the fashionable ladies of the fronde around her on the bedclothes lay scattered the addresses of letters torn off the letters themselves and on these addresses madame de coilin wrote down her thoughts in every direction she bought no stationery the post supplied her with it from time to time a little dog called lily put her nose outside the sheets came to bark at me for five or six minutes and crept back growling into her mistress kennel thus had time settled the young loves of louis quinze madame de chateauroux and her two sisters were cousins of madame de coilin the latter would not have been of the humour as was madame de mailly repentant and a christian to reply to a man who insulted her with a coarse name in the church of saint roche my friend since you know me pray to god for me madame de coilin miserly as are many people of wit piled up her money in cupboards she lived all devoured by a vermin of crown pieces which clung to her skin her servants relieved her 
when i found her plunged in a maze of figures she reminded me of the miser hermocrates who when dictating his will appointed himself his own heir nevertheless she gave a dinner occasionally but she would rail against coffee which nobody liked according to her and which served only to prolong the repast madame de chateaubriand took a journey to vichy with madame de coelin and the marquis de nesle the marquis went on ahead and had excellent dinners prepared madame de coelin came after and asked only for half a pound of cherries on leaving she was presented with huge bills and then there was a terrible outcry she would not hear of anything except the cherries the landlord maintained that whether you ate or did not eat the custom was at an inn to pay for your dinner madame de coelin had invented a form of illuminism to her own taste credulous and incredulous she was led by her want of faith to laugh at those beliefs the superstition of which frightened her she had met madame de coudener the mysterious frenchwoman was illuminated only under reserve she did not please the fervent russian whom she herself liked no better madame de coudener said passionately to madame de coelin madame who is your inside confessor madame replied madame de coelin i know nothing about my inside confessor i only know that my confessor is in the inside of his confessional thereupon the two ladies saw each other no more madame de coelin prided herself on having introduced a novelty at court the fashion of floating chignons in spite of queen marie leschinska who was very pious and who opposed this dangerous innovation she held that formerly no genteel person would ever have thought of paying her doctor crying out against the plentifulness of women's linen that smacks of the upstart she said we women of the court had only two shifts when they were worn out we renewed them we were dressed in silk gowns and we did not look like grisettes like the young ladies of nowadays madame suard who lived in the rue royale had a cock whose crowing annoyed madame de coelin she wrote to madame suard madame have your cock's throat cut madame suard sent back the messenger with this note madame i have the honour to reply to you that i shall not have my cock's throat cut the correspondence went no further madame de coelin said to madame de chateaubriand ah my heart what a time we live in and yet it's that pankuka girl the wife of that member of the academy you know monsieur Enna, a former clerk at the foreign office and as tedious as a protocol used to scribble fat novels one day he was reading a description to madame de coelin a tearful and abandoned love-lorn woman who was mournfully fishing a salmon madame de coelin who was growing impatient and who disliked salmon interrupted the author and said with the serious air which made her so comical monsieur Enna, could you not make that lady catch a different fish the stories which madame de coelin told could not be recollected for there was nothing in them all lay in the pantomime the accent and the expression of the narrator she never laughed there was one dialogue between monsieur and madame jacques minot the perfection of which surpassed everything when in the conversation between the husband and wife madame jacques minot rejoined but monsieur jacques minot the name was pronounced in such a tone that she was seized with immoderate laughter obliged to let this pass madame de coelin gravely waited taking snuff reading in a newspaper of the death of several kings she took off her spectacles and blowing her nose said there's an epizootic among crowned cattle at the moment when she was ready to breathe her last they were maintaining by her bedside that one succumbed only through letting oneself go that if one paid great attention and never lost sight of the enemy one would not die at all i believe it she said but i fear that something would distract me she expired i went down to her room the next day i found monsieur and madame d'avaray her brother-in-law and sister sitting before the fireplace with a little table between them counting the louis in a bag which they had taken from a hollow wainscoting the poor dead woman was there in her bed behind the half-closed curtains she no longer heard the sound of the gold which ought to have awaked her and which fraternal hands were counting among the thoughts written down by the defunct on margins of printed paper and addresses of letters were some which were extremely beautiful madame de coelin showed me what remained of the court of louis quinze under bonaparte and after louis says even as madame de houdetot had enabled me to see what still lingered in the nineteenth century of philosophic society in the summer of the year eighteen o five i went to join madame de chateaubriand at vichy where madame de coelin had taken her as i have said i did not find jussac terme flamarens there whom madame de sevigne had before and behind her in sixteen seventy seven they had been sleeping since one hundred and twenty and so many years i left my sister madame de Caux in paris where she had fixed her residence since the autumn of eighteen o four after a short stay at vichy madame de chateaubriand proposed that we should travel in order to be away for some time from the political troubles two little journeys which i then took in auvergne and to mont blanc have been collected in my works after an absence of thirty-four years i have lately received at clermont 
from men unacquainted with my person the reception usually shown to an old friend he who has long occupied himself with the principles which the human race enjoys in common has friends brothers and sisters in every family for if man is thankless humanity is grateful to those who have connected themselves with you through a kindly reputation and who have never seen you you are always the same you have always the age which they ascribe to you their attachment which is not disturbed by your presence always beholds you young and beautiful like the sentiments which they love in your writings when i was a child in my brittany and heard speak of auvergne i imagined it a very distant very distant country where one saw strange things where one could not go without great danger and travelling under the protection of the blessed virgin i never meet without a sort of melting curiosity those little auvergnats who go to seek their fortunes in this great world with a small deal chest they have little besides hope in their box as they climb down their rocks lucky are they if they bring it back with them alas madame de beaumont had not lain two years on the bank of the tiber when i trod her natal soil in eighteen o five i was at but a few leagues from that mont d'or where she had come in search of the life which she lengthened a little in order to reach rome last summer in eighteen thirty eight i once more travelled through this same auvergne between those two dates eighteen o five and eighteen thirty eight i can place the transformations which society has undergone around me we left clermont and on our way to lyons passed through thiers and rouen this road then little frequented followed at intervals the banks of the lignon the author of the astray who is not a great genius nevertheless invented places and persons that live such is the creative power of fiction when it is appropriate to the age in which it appears there is moreover something ingeniously fantastic in that resurrection of the nymphs and naiads who mingle with shepherds ladies and knights those different worlds go well together and one is agreeably pleased with the fables of mythology united to the lies of fiction rousseau has related how he was taken in by durfey at lyons we again found m ballanche he made the excursion to geneva and mont blanc with us he went wherever one took him without having the smallest business there at geneva i was not received at the gate of the city by clotilda the betrothed of clovis m de barant senior had become prefect of the Leman. at coppet i went to see madame de steel i found her alone buried in her castle which was built round a melancholy courtyard i spoke to her of her fortune and of her solitude as a precious means of independence and happiness i offended her madame de steel loved society she looked upon herself as the most wretched of women in an exile with which i should have been enchanted where in my eyes was the unhappiness of living on one's property with all the comforts of life where was the misfortune of enjoying fame leisure peace in a sumptuous retreat within sight of the alps in comparison with those thousands of breadless nameless helpless victims banished to all the corners of europe while their parents had perished on the scaffold it is sad to be attacked by an ill which the crowd cannot understand for the rest that ill is therefore only the more intense it is not lessened by being confronted with other ills one is not judged by another's pain that which afflicts the one rejoices the other hearts have varied secrets incomprehensible to other hearts let us deny none his sufferings it is with sorrows as with countries each man has his own madame de steel called the next day on madame de chateaubriand at geneva and we left for chamonix my opinion on the scenery of the mountains caused it to be said that i was seeking to make myself singular it will be seen when i come to speak of the saint gothard that i have kept to my opinion in the voyage au mont blanc appears a passage which i will recall as linking together the past events of my life and the events of that same life then still future and to-day also past there is one circumstance alone in which it is true that the mountains produce an oblivion of earthly troubles that is when one withdraws far from the world to consecrate himself to religion an anchorite devoting himself to the service of mankind a saint wishing to meditate in silence on the greatness of god may find peace and joy on desert rocks but it is not then the tranquillity of the spot that passes into the soul of those solitaries it is on the contrary their soul that diffuses its serenity through the region of storms there are mountains which i would still visit with extreme pleasure those for instance of greece and judea i should like to go over the spots with which my new studies lead me daily to occupy myself i would gladly seek upon the table and take at us other colours and other harmonies after painting the unfamed mountains and unknown valleys of the new world the last phrase foretold the voyage which in fact i performed in the next year eighteen o six on our return to geneva without being able to see madame de steel again at coppet we found the inns crammed but for the cares of m de forbin who arrived unexpectedly and procured us a bad dinner in a dark waiting-room 
we should have left the birthplace of Rousseau without eating. M. de Forbin was at that time in a state of beatitude. He displayed in his looks the inner felicity with which he was inundated. His feet did not touch the ground. Wafted on his talent and his blissfulness, he came down from the mountain as though from the sky, with his close-fitting painter's jacket, his palette on his thumb, his brushes in a quiver. A good fellow, nevertheless, although excessively happy, preparing to imitate me one day, when I should have made my voyage to Syria, wishing even to go as far as Calcutta, to make his loves return to him by an uncommon road, when they failed him on the beaten track. His eyes showed a protecting pity. I was poor, humble, uncertain of myself, and I did not hold the hearts of princesses in my mighty hands. In Rome I have had the honour of returning M. de Forbin his lakeside dinner. I had the merit of having become an ambassador. In these days one sees the poor devil whom one has left that morning in the street, turned into a king by evening. The noble gentleman, a painter in right of the revolution, began that generation of artists who dressed themselves up like sketches, grotesques, caricatures, somewhere prodigious mustachios, one would think they were going to conquer the world. Their brushes are halberds, their erasing knives sabres, others have huge beards and hanging or puffed out hair, they smoke a cigar by way of volcano. These cousins of the rainbow, as our old Renier says, have their heads filled with deluges, seas, rivers, forests, cataracts, tempests, or else with carnages, executions, and scaffolds. In their rooms they have human skulls, foils, mandolins, morions, and dolmens. Bragging, pushing, uncivil, liberal, as far as the portrait of the tyrant whom they are painting, they endeavour to form a separate species between the ape and the satyr. They are anxious to make it understood that the secrecy of the studio has its dangers, and that there is no safety for the models. But how handsomely do they not redeem these oddities by a fevered existence, a suffering and sensitive nature, an entire abnegation of self, an incalculable devotion to the miseries of others, a delicate, superior, idealised manner of feeling, a poverty proudly welcomed and nobly endured, lastly, sometimes by immortal talents, the offspring of work, passion, genius, and solitude. Leaving Geneva at night to return to Lyon, we were stopped at the foot of the Fort de l'Ecluse, waiting for the gates to be opened. During this stay of the witches in Macbeth on the heath, strange things passed within me. My dead years came to life again, and surrounded me like a band of phantoms. My burning seasons returned to me in their flame and sadness. My life, hollowed out by the death of Madame de Beaumont, had remained empty. Airy forms, ouries or dreams, issuing from that abyss, took me by the hand and led me back to the days of the sylph. I was no longer in the spot which I occupied. I dreamed of other shores. Some secret influence urged me to the regions of the dawn, whither I was drawn besides by the plan of my new work, and the religious voice which released me from the vow of the village woman, my foster-mother. As all my faculties had extended, as I had never misused life, it superabounded with the pith of my intelligence and art, triumphing in my nature, added to the poet's inspirations. I had what the fathers of the Thebaid called ascensions of the heart. Raphael, forgive the blasphemy of the simile, Raphael, before the transfiguration, only sketched upon the easel, could not have been more electrified by his masterpiece than was I by Eudor and Simodosse, whose names I did not yet know, and whose images I dimly saw through an atmosphere of love and fame. Thus does the native genius, which tormented me in the cradle, sometimes return on its steps after deserting me, Thus are my former sufferings renewed. Nothing heals within me. If my wounds close instantly, they open again suddenly like those of the crucifixes of the Middle Ages, which bleed on the anniversary of the Passion. I have no alternative to obtain relief during these crises, but to give a free course to the fever of my thoughts, in the same way as one has his veins lanced when the blood rushes to the heart or rises to the head. But of what am I speaking? O oh, religion, where then are thy powers, thy restraints, thy balsams? Am I not writing all these things at a distance, of countless years from the hour at which I gave birth to René? I had a thousand reasons to believe myself dead, and I live. Tis a great pity. Those afflictions of the isolated poet, condemned to suffer the spring in spite of Saturn, are unknown to the man who does not go outside the common laws. For him the years are ever young. The young kids, says Oppian, watch over the author of their being. When he comes to fall into the huntsman's net, they offer him in their mouths, the tender flowering grass which they have gone to gather from afar and bring him in their lips fresh water drawn from the adjacent brook on my return from lyons i found letters from m joubert they informed me that it was not possible for him to be at villeneuve before september i replied 
Your departure from Paris is too remote and distresses me. You well know that my wife will never consent to arrive at Villeneuve before you. She has a head of her own, and since she has been with me, I find myself at the head of two heads very difficult to govern. We shall remain at Lyon, where they make us eat so prodigiously that I hardly have the courage to leave this excellent town. The Abbe de Bonville is here, back from Rome. He is wonderfully well. He is merry, he preachifies, and no longer thinks of his woes. He embraces you and will write to you. In short, everybody is in high spirits, except myself. You are the only one to grumble. Tell Fontaine that I have dined with Monsieur Saget. This Monsieur Saget was the providence of the canons. He lived on the hill of saint foy in the district of the Good Wine. The way to his house led up near the spot where Rousseau had spent the night on the banks of the Saône. I remember, he says, spending a delightful night outside the town, on a road which skirted the Saône. Gardens raised terrace-wise bordered the road on the opposite side. It had been very warm that day. The evening was charming. The dew moistened the parched grass. No wind, no quiet night. The air was cool without being chill. The sun after setting had left red vapours in the sky, and their reflection made the water rose-coloured. The trees on the terraces were laden with nightingales, which replied one to the other. I walked along in a sort of ecstasy, abandoning my senses and my heart to the enjoyment of all this, and only sighing a little with regret at enjoying it alone. Absorbed in my sweet reverie, I prolonged my walk well into the night, without perceiving that I was tired. I perceived it at last. I lay down voluptuously on the shelf of a sort of niche or false door, sunk into a terrace wall. The canopy of my bed consisted of the tops of the trees. A nightingale was exactly over my head. I fell asleep to its singing. My slumbers were sweet, my awakening even more so. It was broad daylight. My eyes on opening beheld the water, the verdure, an admirable landscape. With Rousseau's charming itinerary in one's hand, one arrived at Monsieur Saget's. The ancient and lean bachelor, formerly married, wore a green cap, a grey camlet coat, nankeen pantaloons, blue stockings, and beaver shoes. He had lived long in Paris, and had been intimate with Mademoiselle de Vien. She wrote him very witty letters, scolded him, and gave him very good advice. He ignored it, for he did not take the world seriously, believing apparently, like the Mexicans, that the world had already used four sons, and that at the fourth, which is lighting us at present, men had been changed into maggots. He did not trouble his mind about the martyrdom of St. Pothin and St. Irenaeus, nor of the massacre of the Protestants drawn up side by side by order of Mandelot, the governor of Lyon, all of them having their throats cut on the same side. Opposite the field of the shooting at the Brotteau, he would tell me details of it, while strolling among his vines, mingling with his narrative verses of Loy's Labbé. He would not have missed a single mouthful during the last misfortunes of Lyon, under the Chat Verité. On certain days a certain calf's head was served up at saint foy after being soused for five nights, boiled in Madeira, and stuffed full of exquisite things. Very pretty peasant girls waited at table. They served excellent home-grown wine out of demijohns the size of three bottles. We swooped upon the Saget banquet, I and the cassock chapter. The hillside was quite black with us. Our dapiver soon came to the end of his provisions. In the ruin of his last moments, he was taken in by two or three of the old mistresses who had plundered his life. A kind of women, says St. Cyprian, who live as though they could be loved. Quae sic vivis ut possis adamari. We tore ourselves from the delights of Capua to go and see the Chartreuse, still accompanied by M. Ballanche. We hired a calash whose disjointed wheels made a lamentable noise. On reaching Vorep, we stopped at an inn at the top of the town. The next morning, at break of day, we mounted on horseback and set out, preceded by a guide. At the village of Saint Laurent, at the bottom of the Grand Chartreuse, we crossed the threshold of the valley, and passing between two walls of rocks, followed the road leading up to the monastery. When speaking of Combourg, I have told you what I experienced in that spot. The deserted buildings were cracking under the supervision of a kind of farmer of the ruins. A lay brother had remained to take care of an infirm solitary who had just died. Religion had imposed loyalty and obedience upon friendship. We saw the narrow grave freshly covered over, and Napoleon was just about to dig a huge one at Austerlitz. We were shown the convent enclosure, the cells, each with its garden and workshop. We noticed joiners' boards and turners' wheels. The hand had dropped the chisel. In a gallery were displayed the portraits of the superiors of the Chartreuse. The ducal palace at Venice preserves the series of the Ricciati of the Doges. What different spots and memories! High up, at some distance, we were taken to the chapel of Le Sueur's immortal recluse. 
After dining in an immense kitchen, we set out again and met, carried in a palanquin like a rajah, M. Chaptal, formerly an apothecary, then a senator, next owner of Chanteloup and inventor of beetroot sugar, the greedy heir of the beautiful Indian reed canes of Sicily, perfected by the Otaheitan sun. As I descended from the forests, my thoughts turned to the cenobites of old. For centuries they carried, together with a little earth in the skirts of their gowns, fir plants which have grown into trees on the rocks. Happy, O ye, who travelled noiselessly through the world, nor even turned your heads in passing. No sooner had we reached the entrance to the valley than a storm burst, a deluge dashed down, and vexed torrents rushed roaring from every ravine. Madame de Chateaubriand, becoming reckless for very fear, galloped through the flint stones, the water and the lightning flashes. She had flung away her umbrella the better to hear the thunder. The guide cried to her, Recommend your soul to God, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. We reached Oreb to the sound of the tocsin. What remained of the cloven storm lay before us. In the distant landscape we saw a blazing village, and the moon rounding out the upper portion of his disk above the clouds, like the pale, bald forehead of St. Bruno, the founder of the Order of Silence. M. Ballanche, all dripping with rain, said with his immovable placidity, I am like a fish in the water. I have just seen Voreppe again in this year, 1838. The storm was there no longer, but two witnesses of it still remain, Madame de Chateaubriand and M. Ballanche. I mention this because I have too often in these memoirs had to call attention to the dead. On returning to Lyon, we left our companion there and went to Villeneuve. I have told you about this little town, my walks and my regrets on the banks of the Yonne with M. Joubert. Three old maids used to live there, Mademoiselle Piat. They reminded me of my grandmother's three friends at Planquet, saving the difference in social position. The virgins of Villeneuve died one after the other, and I thought of them when I saw a grass-grown flight of steps running up outside their empty house. What used these village damsels to talk about in their time? They spoke of a dog, and of a muff which their father had once bought them at saint Fair. To me this was as charming as the council of the same town at which St. Bernard had Abelard, my fellow Breton, condemned. The maids of the muff were Eloise's paps. Perhaps they loved, and their letters brought to light will one day entrance posterity. Who knows? Perhaps they wrote to their lord, also their father, also their brother, also their spouse, Domino Sur, Imo Patri, etc., that they felt honoured by the name of friend, by the name of mistress, or of courtesan, concubinae velscorti. In the midst of his learning, says a grave doctor, I find that Abelard played an admirably foolish prank when he suborned with love his pupil Eloise. A great and new sorrow surprised me at Villeneuve. To tell it you, I must go back to a few months before my Swiss journey. I was still occupying the house in the Rue Miromenil, when, in the autumn of 1804, Madame de Caux came to Paris. The death of Madame de Beaumont had finished the affecting of my sister's reason. She was very near refusing to believe in the death, suspecting some mystery in the disappearance, or including heaven in the number of the enemies who mocked at her misfortunes. She had nothing. I had chosen an apartment in the Rue Comartin for her, deceiving her as to the rent and as to the arrangements which I told her to make with the keeper of an eating-house. Like a flame ready to expire, her genius shed the brightest light. She was all illumined with it. She would write a few lines which she threw into the fire, or else copy from books some thoughts in harmony with the disposition of her soul. She did not remain long in the Rue Comartin. She went to live with the Dame Saint-Michel in the Rue du Faubourg Saint-Jacques. Madame de Navarre was the superior of the convent. Lucille had a little cell overlooking the garden. I noticed that she followed with her eyes, with I know not what gloomy longing, the nuns who walked in the enclosure around the vegetable beds. One could guess that she envied the saints, and going further, aspired to the angels. I will sanctify these memoirs by deposing in them as relics the following letters of Madame de Caux, written before she had taken flight for her eternal country. 17th January I had placed all my happiness in you and in Madame de Beaumont. I fled from my cares and my sorrows in the thought of you too. My whole occupation was to love you. Last night I made long reflections upon your character and your ways. As you and I are always near each other, it needs some time, I think, to know me. Such is the variety of ideas in my head. Such is the opposition of my timidity and my peculiar external weakness to my real inner strength. Too much about myself. My illustrious brother, accept my fondest thanks for all the favours and all the marks of friendship which you have never ceased to show me. This is the last letter you will receive from me in the morning, albeit I communicate my ideas to you. They nevertheless remain quite completely within myself. No date. Do you seriously, dear, think me safe from some impertinence on the part of Monsieur Chandolet? I am quite determined not to invite him to continue his visits. 
I resign myself to look upon Tuesdays as the last. I do not wish to trouble his politeness. I am closing for ever the book of my fate and sealing it with the seal of reason. I shall now consult its pages no more on the trifles than on the important things of life. I give up all my foolish notions. I wish neither to occupy nor to vex myself with those of other people. I will abandon myself with heart and soul to all the events of my passage through this world. What a pity that I should pay myself so much attention. God can now afflict me only in you. I thank him for the precious, kind and dear present which he has made me in your person, and for having preserved my life without stain. Those are all my treasures. I could take for an emblem of my life the moon in a cloud with this device often obscured never tarnished farewell dear you will perhaps be surprised at my words since yesterday morning since i saw you my heart has raised itself to god and i have laid it wholly at the foot of the cross its sole and true place thursday good morning dear what colour are your ideas this morning as for me i remember that the only person who was able to relieve me when i was fearing for madame de farcy's life was she who said to me but it is within the range of possible things that you may die before her could any one have spoken more to the point there is nothing dear like the idea of death to rid us of the future i hasten to rid you of myself this morning for i feel myself too much in the mood to say fine things good-bye my poor brother keep joyful no date while madame de farcy lived always by her side i had not noticed the need of being in communion of thought with some one i possessed that advantage unconsciously but since we lost that friend and circumstances having separated me from you i have known the torture of never being able to refresh and renew one's mind in some one's conversation i feel that my ideas hurt me when i am unable to get rid of them this has surely to do with my bad organization nevertheless i am fairly satisfied since yesterday with my courage i pay no attention to my grief and to the sort of inward faintness which i feel i have abandoned myself continue to be always kind to me before long it will be humanity good-bye dear till soon i hope no date be easy dear my health is recovering visibly i often ask myself why i take so much pains to bolster it up i am like a madman who should build a fortress in the middle of a desert farewell my poor brother no date as i have a bad headache to-night i have just simply and at haphazard written down some thoughts of fenelon's for you so as to keep my promise we are confined within narrow limits when we shut ourselves up in our own existence on the contrary we feel at liberty when we quit this prison to enter into the immensity of god we shall soon find once more all that we have lost we are daily approaching it with rapid strides yet a little while and we shall no more have cause to weep it is we who die what we love still lives and shall never die you impart to yourself a deceitful strength such as a raging fever gives to a sick man for some days past a sort of convulsive movement has been visible in you from the effort to affect an air of gaiety and courage whilst the silent anguish filled your soul that is as much as my head and my bad pen permit me to write to you this evening if you like i will begin again to-morrow and perhaps tell you some more good evening dear i shall never cease telling you that my heart prostrates itself before that of fenelon whose tenderness seems to me so profound and his virtue so exalted good-bye dear i am awake and offer you a thousand loves and a hundred blessings i feel well this morning and am anxious as to whether you will be able to read me and whether those thoughts of fenelon's will seem to you well chosen i fear my heart has concerned itself too much with the selection no date could you think that since yesterday i have been madly occupied in correcting you the blossacks have trusted me with one of your novels in the greatest secrecy as i do not think that you have made the most of your ideas i am amusing myself by trying to render them in their full value can audacity go further than that forgive me great man and remember that i am your sister and that i have some little right to make an ill use of your riches saint michel i will no longer say do not come to see me again because having from now but a few days to spend in paris i feel that your presence is essential to me do not come to-day until four i expect to be out till then dear i have in my head a thousand contradictory ideas touching things which seem to me to exist and not to exist which to me have the effect of objects of which one only caught sight in a glass and of which consequently one could not make sure however distinctly one saw them i wish to trouble about all this no longer from this moment i abandon myself and like you i have not the resource of changing banks but i feel sufficient courage to attach no importance to the persons and things on my shore and to fix myself entirely and irrevocably in the author of all justice and all truth there is only one displeasure to which i fear that i shall grow insensible with great difficulty that of unintentionally in passing 
striking against the destiny of some other person not because of any interest that might be taken in me i am not mad enough for that saint michel dear never did the sound of your voice give me so much pleasure as when i heard it yesterday on my staircase my ideas then strove to overcome my courage i was seized with content to feel you so near me you appeared and my whole inner being returned to orderliness i sometimes feel a great repugnance at heart to drinking my cup how can that heart which is so small a space contain so much existence and so much grief i am greatly dissatisfied with myself greatly dissatisfied my affairs and my ideas carry me away i scarcely occupy myself with god now and i confine myself to saying to him a hundred times a day o oh lord make haste to hearken unto my prayer for my spirit waxeth faint no date brother do not grow weary of my letter nor of my company think that soon you will be forever released from my importunities my life is casting its last light like a lamp which has burnt out in the darkness of a long night and which sees the rise of the dawn in which it is to die please brother cast a single glance at the early moments of our existence remember that we have often been seated on the same lap and pressed both together to the same bosom that already you added tears to mine that from the earliest days of your life you protected and defended my frail existence that our games united us and that i shared your first studies i will not speak to you of our adolescence of the innocence of our thoughts and of our joys nor of our mutual need to see each other incessantly if i retrace the past i candidly confess brother that it is to make me revive the more in your heart when you left france for the second time you placed your wife in my hands you made me promise never to part from her true to this dear engagement i voluntarily stretched out my hands to the irons and entered into the regions destined alone for the victims vowed to death in those abodes i have had no anxiety save as to your fate incessantly i questioned the forebodings of my heart touching yourself when i had recovered my liberty amidst the ills which came to overwhelm me the thought alone of our meeting kept me up to-day when i am irretrievably losing the hope of running my course by your side bear with my griefs i shall become resigned to my destiny and it is only because i am still fighting against it that i suffer such cruel anguish but when i shall have grown submissive to my fate and what a fate where are my friends my protectors and my treasures to whom matters my existence that existence abandoned by all and weighing down entirely upon itself my god are not my present woes enough for my weakness without yet adding to them the dread of the future forgive me my too dear friend i will resign myself i will fall asleep in a slumber as of death upon my destiny but during the few days which i have to spend in this town let me seek my last consolations in you let me believe that my presence is sweet to you believe me among the hearts that love you none approaches the sincerity and tenderness of my impotent friendship for you fill my memory with agreeable recollections which prolong my existence beside you yesterday when you spoke to me of coming to you you seemed to me anxious and serious while your words were affectionate why brother could i be to you also a subject of aversion and annoyance you know it was not i that proposed the amiable distraction of going to see you and that i promised you to make no ill use of it but if you have changed your opinion why did you not tell me so frankly i have no courage to set against your politeness formerly you used to distinguish me a little more from the common herd and to do me more justice as you reckon upon me to-day i will come to see you presently at eleven o'clock we will arrange together what seems best to you for the future i have written to you feeling sure that i should not have the courage to say to you a single word of what this letter contains end of book four part one